One of the things I've been doing this year is uh, it, it came to my attention that after nine years of pastoring that most of the people in the church actually haven't heard the sermons I first preached my first year. Now, some of those sermons, you're probably glad that you didn't hear. <laughs> but there's a few that are teaching on some important topics that need to be uh, emphasized, that are important. Uh, and so I kind of have been in a process of going through some of those old sermons and uh, praying about, Lord, which ones would you have me preach on this and that? And uh, so what happened was um, I was thinking about my very first Mother's Day sermon I ever preached. And uh, I couldn't find it. I was looking everywhere for it. And um, I finally realized I must have had a crazy week that week. Or I don't know what would happen. But I actually hand wrote my notes for that sermon. I didn't type them. So they're not in my all my files on my computer. And uh, so then I ended up finding this, this old binder I had with my handwritten notes before I, when I first started preaching, before I started um, typing out my sermons. And I found them there, and they're all in pencil. I always wrote in pencil so I could erase and add and change things, you know, as brainstorming through the week, you know. And so I had to go and take those, they're think pencil, bad, bad, you know, you all know I have really bad handwriting, so bad handwriting and, and figuring out and, uh, and so I, I was looking over that message, and I was like, you know, this is an important message. And so the only one who might remember this is my wife and Jody. You might remember it. Don't, don't remember, of course, who all was there that first, um, um, that first um, Mother's, Day. Mother's Day. Yes. And so uh, the title of the message is Why We Honor Mothers. Why We Honor Mothers. This is an important um, an important teaching today. Um, another thing that happened was I was looking through and um, in my sermon notes, um, if I have a story I'm going to tell, I'm, I'm, I don't tell stories every time I preach unless they just pop into my mind randomly. I'm not a preacher who's like, you have to have a joke and you have to, I, I am a joke, I don't have to always have a joke. Um, I, you have to have a joke and then you have to have a, a little illustration, you know, a little story. I, I'm not like that. I just go, Bible, here's what it says. Here's what you need to do. Amen. Bye, you know. So that, that's me. I, and so, uh, but anyway, uh, but sometimes I do think of a story, and there was something that happened in the news around that time, nine years ago, 2015. It just seems like forever. <laughs> How old are you, Isaac, 2015? I don't know. <laughs> what year were you born? Eight. eight. He was eight. 2000. Okay, okay. So you were eight years old. Okay, so hopefully you remember this sermon. Hopefully you've been doing it. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, well, that's why I'm giving it to you again, right? So... I'm sure Lydia doesn't remember the sermon. So, um, uh, but anyway, I, it said uh, in the in the lesson it said, or in in the notes it said, story, and that's what I do. I'll put story in my, and then I'll put just something about the story. So the story, Toya Graham. No. Story. I was like, did I spell that wrong? Who's Toya Graham? I mean, I know who Billy Graham is, but who's Toya Graham? And so I went, what's that story? So I went on Google. I Googled my own sermon <laughs> illustration. <laughs> what was the story I told about somebody named Toya Graham? Google it. And I'll tell you who Toya Graham is at the end of the sermon. So, now I have to stay. Okay, okay. Let's read Proverbs chapter 31. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. You know, a lot of times when we think of Proverbs 31, we think of, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. And then we go down. Well, that's toward the end of the chapter. But if you start at the beginning, it says the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Do you know that Proverbs 31 was written by a mother? So if you ever read Proverbs 31 and go, man, that's such a high standard for womanhood and motherhood, you got a woman to blame for that. Don't blame us if you didn't think of this. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We know, of course, the Holy Spirit inspired what was written. But I want you to know that Proverbs 31 is the prophecy that his mother taught him. This is the words of a mother who wrote this. And so we can learn a lot from this passage. Now, the first question is, who is King Lemuel? Well, Proverbs was written by Solomon. But in this passage, it says there's a king named Lemuel, and his mother taught him something. So people have speculated for years. But now in Hebrew, the word Lemuel means belonging to God. Belonging to God. And it's written in Hebrew. And it's written 
Um, the section that is about uh, the last 22 verses, uh, that is about how to find a virtuous woman. It's written, each verse starts with um, Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav. It starts with, the, each one starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's designed for Hebrew young men to memorize all the qualifications of a wife. So they could remember, okay, what's the 15th thing I'm supposed to look for in a woman? Oh, it's the 15th letter of the alphabet. It's a way for them to remember. There, by the way, there's a lot of poetry in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that is actually written that way. If you saw, um, um, so the most famous is Psalm 119. It'll say Aleph, and then there's eight verses. Then it'll say Beth, and there's eight verses. It says Gimel, eight verses. Those are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you read it in Hebrew, it will. The, 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 each verse starts with that letter. So you have eight verses that start with Aleph, and you have eight verses that start with Beth. And that's why you have 176 uh, verses. That's why it's so long. Because you have eight verses times 22. So eight times 22 is 176. And that was your homeschool lesson for you homeschool kids. Okay, so well, homeschool kids need to learn math too. So. Okay, so, uh, um, so this is instructions. And so it's written, right, in Hebrew. And we know that it was originally written in Hebrew or it wouldn't have all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet that it starts, right? Only one nation spoke Hebrew, Israel. Mm -hmm. So right now we can narrow it down. Who was King Lemuel? Well, he was a king of Israel. We know that, right? So this is Hebrew. This is Israel, King Lemuel. Um, Solomon wrote Proverbs. But the name Solomon, me, uh, say main, name Lemuel means belonging to God. And uh, Solomon had another name that the prophet Nathan gave him, and it was Jedidiah, Yedidiah. And Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that King Lemuel, Solomon, most, most people believe that, um, because you have to pick a king of Israel, and since it was uh, all part of the Proverbs, it's most likely Solomon. And um, also, I believe that Lemuel was his mother's name for him. Right? She says, she calls him Lemuel in there. As you know how moms have nicknames for their, you know. So, you know, maybe she, maybe when he was in trouble, she'd be like, Lemuel Solomon, you know. But maybe Lemuel was her, her favorite name for him. And maybe she named him that, belonging to God. Belong, get dedicated to God, belonging to God. Um, and she calls him Lemuel. So I believe it's Solomon. And it was a, it was a teaching that his mother gave him now. If it's Solomon, does anyone know what Solomon's mother's name was? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Now that's someone you wouldn't necessarily hold up as an example for other mothers, but God made her an example. God took her from someone who, I'm not, now, okay, I don't want to get distracted on another topic. I personally do not blame Bathsheba for what happened with David and Bathsheba because he was a king. And if you disobey a king, usually you're dead. And in fact, Uriah, her husband, wouldn't do what the king wanted to do, and then he was dead, right? So I don't blame Bathsheba for what happened um, there. Uh, everything, what happened with he, with him and her, that, that there was an accidental scene wasn't intentional. The Bible never indicates. It says he saw her. He doesn't say anything about she was trying to show herself, anything like that. There's not even a hint in the Bible of her, of her doing anything appropriate, just something that happened. And and the Bible blames David. There's really no mention of any blame for Bathsheba. Okay? And David was a king. He could do anything he wanted. You can look. Genesis and Revelation, there's no mention of any responsibility on Bathsheba. If you got an idea of responsibility on Bathsheba, you got it from a book besides the Bible. In the Bible, you won't see anything of blaming Bathsheba. And I believe the main reason is he was a king. And back then, king could do anything that he wanted. And it would be unheard of to refuse a king or to say anything against a king, okay? It would be similar to some of these Hollywood Me Too type situations, okay? But I will say this. She could have refused whatever the cost, right? And you ought to, right? You ought to say no to sin no matter the cost, even if it means dying. I mean that, right? You don't sin uh, to please unearthly authority. So yes, Bathsheba, it's easy for us in our comfortable life now. We're not, we don't have a king calling us into his bedroom. So it's easy for us to say, well, Bathsheba was wrong, but it would be hard. But she should have said, absolutely not. What are the consequences? If she died, she died. She should have refused. Okay, we can agree to that because you don't, you ought to be God rather than men. Okay, 
But either, e either way, she was in the wrong by not refusing him, by not rejecting him. Okay, she was wrong for that. Um, but uh, um, but I, I don't know if we should necessarily be too hard on her because that would have been a tough situation. I think we should be careful assuming that if we were living in that culture at that time and a king called us in, and that we would have been so bold and brave to say no and possibly been killed for it. Okay, So I just want you to understand that we should be careful not to be too judgmental of her, but I think she has she does bear responsibility. So that she led it, she made some bad choices, okay? And now she's married to David, and her husband died, and now her first child was uh, um, the consequence of sin is her that child that was conceived that would actually die. That was the consequence. So this would have been a second child that she had, and this was a child that became the next king of Israel, which was Solomon. So Lemuel is most likely Solomon. His mother is Bathsheba. Now, here's what I want you to know, though. She made bad choices in her life. And have we all made bad choices? Yeah. Do we all have a past? Have we all sinned and come short of the glory of God? All of us have. So, you know, that's an encouragement to us right there. If God took, if Bathsheba gave her son godly counsel, the Bible calls it a prophecy. So this is something that came from the Lord for her to give to her son. And it ended up in our Bible, and we've used it for thousands of years, and it's been a great encouragement and a help and a guidance and wisdom for us, then God can take a broken situation and turn it into something good. And we know, of course, that Jesus Christ was born and descended from Bathsheba and Saul. So God can take something bad and turn it into something good. In fact, that's all he does. Everybody here is a sinner saved by grace. Every single person here, God took something bad. I don't care if you're... Saved when you were a little kid. It doesn't matter. You were a sinner. You chose to disobey a holy God because you wanted to do what you wanted to do. And you're a sinner and sin separated from God. And Jesus Christ saved you. Amen. And God took something bad and turned something good. And, and think, of, think of Jesus Christ being nailed to a cross and how terrible thing it was that we killed the Son of God. And yet he became the Savior of the world. He said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. What an amazing thing. That the worst thing that ever happened in the history of the world, when we killed the innocent Son of God, that that became the salvation for the human race. So God can take the worst situation and turn it around. So right there, there's an encouragement right there. Here is Bathsheba giving advice to her son Solomon. Most likely that's her. And she made bad choices, but she became a godly mother. And uh, Bathsheba taught Solomon important principles. And so... Um, now I just want to read verse 2. He says, she says this, What my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. She says, she says three statements. You know, preachers love three statements because then they give three points. Right? <laughs> and sometimes in the Bible, though, there's a, you know, I, I, I preached a sermon with 26 points one time. No, I did, actually, but it wasn't, it wasn't as long as I think it. I think it went about an hour. But... Um, but in this case, we have three points. He says, what my son, what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Now, she's going to teach him something. But she says, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. I think she's saying, I mean, this is Hebrew, so they have a different way of talking, right? We come across that, and you're trying to translate Spanish, and, and they have a different way of saying it. And so you, so that, that's literally what she says in Hebrew, is what my son, and what the son of my womb, what the son of my vows. She's saying to him, essentially, I have some things to tell you, but what I have to tell you is based on the fact that you are my son, the fact that you are the son of my womb, and the fact that you are the son of my vows. And these are three very important principles that relate to being a mother. Very important principles that relate to being a mother. And I want to show you in this passage how what she's teaching here, how that um, relates to why we honor mothers. Okay? So I want to I read the instruction she gave him, and then we will talk about those three statements. She says, first of all, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroy the kings. Now right there, um, here's my... Uh, paraphrase of that. She tells him, don't have girlfriends. What? She's telling him, don't give your strength to women. Now, she's not telling him to not have a wife. Later on, she says, who can find a virtuous woman? You need a wife, not a girlfriend. You need to find a life partner that you can serve the Lord with. 
God created marriage. Marriage is a good thing. You need to find a virtuous woman. But don't give your strength unto women. Um, that the word there for strength has to do with like being a mighty man, a mighty warrior. Hey, listen. Uh, getting involved with relationships that don't involve commitment and getting involved in immorality, it will take away your strength, man. It'll rob you. Young men, it'll rob you of your strength, your ability to serve God and be a man of God. It'll be destroyed. He said, give, she said, give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. A lot of people think, because I tell people, don't date, don't have girlfriends or boyfriends. They think, oh, what, what are you supposed to do? Arrange marriages like India? You know, I have a saying I say about that. I say in India, parents arrange marriages. In America, young people arrange their own marriages, but in the Bible, God arranged marriages. God arranged marriages. So what you need to do is you need to pray about who you are to marry. And you need to get to know the person well before you become romantically attached to them so that you know their true character. You need to know them more as a friend. You need to get to know them in more group situations. The Bible says treat the younger women as sisters with all purity, the younger men as brethren, okay? So you need to have a platonic relationship with them first so you can get to know them, what kind of person they are, so when your mind is not already made up because you're so in love with them, you can actually make a wise choice. And there's nothing wrong with emotions, there's nothing wrong with romance, there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with falling in love. Those are all part of how God created you. But you won't make a good decision once you're all madly in love with them. So you need to be in a platonic relationship with them first. Now, that's what it means in the Bible when it says the younger men as brethren, the younger as women as sisters in all purity. That's what Paul commanded young, a young man named, named Timothy. He didn't want him getting in the wrong bad situation. So he said, treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. And so... That's another message, but it's in here, isn't it? Don't give your strength to women, that which destroyeth kings. See, Solomon's going to be a king. He's going to have tremendous power and influence. God is going to use his wisdom. People are going to come all over the world to come and hear the wisdom of Solomon. And he, God is going to use him to build the temple. He had a very important responsibility, and his mother's like, Solomon, be careful. Don't give your strength to women. Don't get involved in relationships that don't involve commitment. Right? But here's how you find a virtuous woman. Um, then she says, uh, the next thing she says is, lest they drink, um, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. You know, it's interesting. The first thing she said is, don't have girlfriends. I mean, that's my interpretation of what she's saying, all right? You can interpret it your way. I'm telling you what I think it's saying. Another one is she says is she says it is not for kings to drink wine. Now, a lot of American Christians will teach you that what she meant was it is not for kings to drink too much wine. But that is not what she said. She said it is not for kings to drink wine. Nor for princes strong drink. Now, what I believe that is, and everybody's entitled to their interpretation, what I believe that's saying is this, I believe in the Bible... When the, you, the word wine means any drink that comes from grapes. So I believe there was fermented and unfermented wine. I'm just telling you what I believe, okay? And there are historical sources that teach that they had a way of um, uh, preserving grape juice so that it would not actually ferment. One way would be to concentrate it down so that the sugar would keep it from fermenting. Another way would be they would uh, cover it in a cool... Uh, put it in a cool pond and they would uh, seal uh, the... Uh, they, would, they would put it in a pot and they would seal it with wax. Um, and so, not a message about that, but what I'm getting at is this, very often we want to make prohibitions in the Bible, we want to make them about, just don't have too much. And in this passage, it doesn't actually say that. Again, in childhood interpretation, I'm telling you what I believe it's saying here, lest they drink and forget the law. So, uh, how do we bring that into 2023? Any substance that takes over your mind, that can cause you to become addicted, or that can change your personality, your mind, so that you are not in control of your mind, would be the equivalent of that, okay? The Bible says that drunkenness is a sin, and she's warning him to not drink wine at all. The Bible says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. It says, don't even look at it. When it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself right, so when it's fermented, that's when it's moving, right? The bubbles are moving. It says, at the last, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. And I believe that's referring to the alcohol. So I believe, just telling you my interpretation, um, I've had people disagree with me, and they're still my brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'm telling you what I believe. I believe she was telling him, don't drink alcohol. Okay? So 
Warning him about addiction. Warning him about substances that change your mind. There are many, many other things besides alcohol, right? That control your mind, that change your mind. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What that means is those are opposites. Uh, that's why the Nazarites couldn't have any wine, right? So then they could be filled with the Spirit. Um, because um, if your mind is being controlled by a chemical, you cannot be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And the Bible commands us to be filled with the Spirit. We need to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can't surrender our minds to another chemical. Now, there might be a time where you need an operation or something. So you have to take something that knocks you out or something like that, right? Or there might be strong pain meds that also they'll tell you you can't drive because you're on these pain meds. If it's for something medical, it's a little bit different. You're doing it for that reason. But I think that you have to be careful with that, right? Because people get addicted to pain meds, right? People get uh, people. And sometimes there's milder things and different things you can take that isn't as dangerous, right? Uh, but of course, you're not capable of being in your right mind when you're on the operating table anyway. So in that situation, it's not a situation where you need to be filled with the Spirit. You just need to be asleep so that someone can cut you open and fix whatever's wrong with you, right? Okay, so that's another teaching she gave him. She says, what? Do I have a girlfriend? She said, don't drink alcohol. She said, I give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine to those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And what she's saying there, I believe, isn't necessarily commanding people to give a strong drink to someone who's ready to perish, but it's teaching a principle that the people who go to alcohol and the people that go to substances that change their minds so that they're not in control anymore, they're trying to escape from something. They have problems in their lives that need to be fixed, and they're trying to escape from that. And so substances that change your mind are an escape from reality that's what that passage is actually teaching and of course if you're a king right um or if you're a child of god you don't want to be escaping from reality just trying to just blow your mind on some substance you want to be totally connected with reality because god wants you to serve him and please him so uh, then she says in verse 8, it says, uh, verse 8, Open thy mouth for the dumb, and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. He's going to be a king. So he needs to make sure that he is defending justice, right? You have to have justice in your country. You have to, you have to care about doing what is right. So she says, don't have girlfriends. Don't drink alcohol. Do what is right. And then the last thing she teaches him in this is, marry a virtuous woman. Is that good advice? Is that good advice from a mom? Hey, can a mom that has a bad past still help tell her children you need to be careful who you marry? Yes. So a lot of times young people will look at their parents and their life before and they'll be like, well, mom and dad, you did it wrong. Like Maybe you got pregnant out of wedlock or maybe you're on your second or third marriage or maybe you, maybe you did you know, smoke weed or maybe you drank alcohol, so I should be able to do it too. You ever heard that? I've heard that a million times, right? Well, you did it, dad. Hey, just... What about what Bathsheba did? Do you think that, that Solomon should do that too? Oh. No. So God takes a, a parent who's had a bad life and problems and made a lot of mistakes. And yes, even is sometimes a hypocrite. And parent, our children can see all of our hypocrisy because they see us at home when no one else sees us, right? But listen, but just because a parent is struggling with their past and trying to move on, and just because a parent is sometimes a hypocrite, hey, listen, that doesn't mean you don't listen to your parents. Because they know from personal experience and they're trying to spare you. They're trying to spare you. And even if they fall and even if they fail, hey, listen, did you know part of the reason why they're failing all the time is because they have bad habits from the past that they have trouble breaking? And so every time your parent, especially young people, listen to me, every time your parent is a hypocrite and does something different than what they believe, why don't you take that as a warning that you don't want to make the mistakes they made when they were young because you may end up being a hypocrite when you have kids. Think about it. You're going to go down the exact same path they did if you just look at them and go, well, you're doing it so I can do it too. Well, that's really dumb. The whole reason they're doing it is because they get trapped in those bad habits and those patterns that are hard to get out of, not excusing anything they do that's wrong. But they sometimes have trouble getting free from their past, and that's why they're trying to spare you. Don't do it. Don't do it. So... Parents who have made bad choices like Bathsheba, they can give good advice to their children. And listen, the Bible says if you honor your father and mother, it'll be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. Well, mom and dad didn't honor their parents and so they had a short life, so I guess I'll have a short life too. Okay. Does that sound like a good idea? <laughs> My dad ended up in prison, so sounds like a fun place to be. 
<laughs> right? My mom ended up in addiction, so that sounds like a fun place to be. No. Learn from your parents. The Bible says in Ezekiel 18, you can look at what your parents did and you can say, I'm not going to do that because that didn't turn out well. The Bible says to honor your father and mother, not if they're perfect and never sin. It just says honor your father and mother and be well with you. Do you think when God commanded us to honor our parents, you think he knew that they were going to be hypocrites? I think God is so stupid he didn't know that. <laughs> of course, he knew that there were going to be parents who were hypocrites. There were going to be parents who made bad decisions. And he said, honor your father and mother, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live on there. He said, he didn't say your parents will have a better life if you become their slaves. He didn't say that. That's what sometimes young people think. He said, you will have a better life if you honor your parents in spite of their mistakes, in spite of their problems. Hey, are parents sometimes hypocrites? Yes. Hey, are teenagers ever hypocrites? Yes. No. Of course. Of course. But listen, if parents are sometimes hypocrites, that's on them. I've preached messages, many messages on hypocrisy before, but today we're preaching on Mother's Day. We're not preaching about that today. Today, it's about Mother's Day, and Mother's Day is about you honoring your mom. It's about you honoring your parents. And it will be well with you. You will have a better life if you listen to your parents' advice. So now, Bathsheba is talking about a virtuous woman. And wow, she even has it all alphabetically listed. So beautiful. And the poetry is amazing. Hebrew poetry is incredible. That's why you guys love that song, on Yisrael Hai. Right? The poetry is amazing in Hebrew. You know, It's very beautiful. It's very powerful. But Bathsheba, you were a bad example. You had a bad past. What right do you have to write a beautiful poem about a virtuous woman when you weren't even a virtuous woman? Well, she's trying to help her son find one. And you know, I dare say she's been through a few hard knocks of her own. You look at, here, at her later on when David is dying and she's talking to the prophet Nathan and she's talking to her husband and she's making sure that her son Solomon becomes the next king. You can tell she's learned a few things and she's got some wisdom over the years. And she is going to teach Solomon how to find a good wife. And she doesn't say anything in here about who can find a thousand virtuous women. Their prices are far above her. She doesn't say that. So you know Solomon wasn't really following. Later, he didn't really follow her advice. But that doesn't mean that we can't. We can read this and follow it. So she says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field and buyeth it. And with the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. Her husband is a leader. The man who sat in the gate is a leader. And she is a virtuous woman, and she's really the secret to her husband's success. Because it's talking about her, and then it mentions her husband. He's known in the gates, and he sits with the elders of the land. He is helping make decisions that guide the, the future of that city and of that country. And that's attributed to her, the wife. You understand what power you have, ladies, with your husband. You have incredible power. Bathsheba had incredible influence. She was married to King David. And she's, so she's talking about the influence of a mother and a wife. She maketh fine linen and selleth it. She delivereth girdles, girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Hey, do you know what it says about Bathsheba? This is ironic. 
But I listen to the Bible every morning um, when I'm getting myself ready in the morning to get out of the shower and brush my teeth and shaving. All I listen to the Bible on audio. And I was listening this morning. I'm happy, I am I listen to a, a book of the Bible in English, and I listen to that book again in Spanish. So I'm trying to learn Spanish. I know, I've been trying for a long time. So anyway, um, I was listening in Spanish, and the passage I listened to was 2 Samuel 11, the passage about Bathsheba, David and Bathsheba. That's interesting, huh? I'm preaching on Bathsheba today, and that just happened to be the passage I was listening to. And that passage, I listened to it all in English, now I'm listening in Spanish, so I'm back in Spanish. And it says, uh, Mujer hermosa, right? It's a beautiful woman. It says he saw a woman washing herself, and that woman was beautiful to be to look upon. It was be she was beautiful to look upon. Now, Bathsheba was beautiful to look upon. And that's where all the trouble started, right? Nothing wrong with her being beautiful, but that's how he got himself in trouble, right? But look at what Bathsheba says here. Favor is deceitful. What that's referring to is a woman can sweet talk you, right? She can have favor with you. She can learn. Women have a lot of power, especially with men, but they have a lot of power. They have a lot of influence. And a woman can kind of dazzle you with her beauty and the way she talks and what she says, and she can lure you in, okay? That's like a whole art, a whole art form that women know and they talk about, okay? Especially like the girls in high school, who's going to get the jock or whatever. I don't know. I never went to high school because I'm a homeschool kid, but I know that happens. I read about it. I heard about it, okay? And, uh, and I had a few girls try to pull a few charms on me, too. And I just say right away, are you a Christian? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm a Christian. Oh, great. Hey, let's go to church. Let's get to know each other. Let's just be friends first. Only friends. Bye. <laughs> My wife didn't do that. That's why she became my wife. She was willing to be just friends, even though we were just friends for six weeks, then we were engaged. So <laughs> It was a very short friendship, but that'd be a lesson to you. Be just friends. See what happens. It'll be amazing. But I wanted to make sure she was a virtuous woman. She probably wanted to make sure I was a good guy. Hopefully, I was. Hopefully, I still am. Maybe I can be gooder. <laughs> Brother Joe Arthur is my favorite preacher. He pastors the Harvest Baptist Tabernacle in Jonesboro, Georgia, South Carolina. And he says, don't you wish they'd let people from North Carolina and Virginia write the dictionary? They could have put so so many words in there, so many better words like gooder. <laughs> <laughs> Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain. Mm. Bathsheba was beautiful. But boy, that beauty wasn't mixed with virtue, was there? And boy, I got her into trouble. I wonder if she's thinking of that when she writes that. Favor is deceitful. Beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. You know what I think? I think she was fearing David. She wasn't fearing the Lord. She was fearing David. That's how she got herself in trouble. She was beautiful, and she didn't have the fear of the Lord. Whew. Now, there's nothing wrong with being beautiful. I married somebody very beautiful. That's another thing Joe Arthur likes to say. He says, I was at, got this advice to all you young men. If you're going to get involved in something as serious as till death do you part, you might as well have yourself something nice to look at. Say amen right there. <laughs> Those southern boys, they can say it different, can't they? And he said, and you say, yeah, but beauty's only skin deep. Yeah, but that ugly cuts right to the bone. <laughs> So nothing wrong with beauty. Okay, that's I'll translate it for Northerners. What he just said there. If you, I don't know if you understood that. Even. But what he's saying is there's nothing wrong with beauty. There's nothing wrong with marrying a beautiful woman. You know, you know, it's not like we go around as yeah, as young guys going, oh, look at that one. She's got a nose as long as a carrot, and she's covered with warts. I think I'll marry that one. That's not that's not what we do, right? We, obviously, we want to marry a beautiful woman. Nothing wrong with that. But listen, when it comes to looking for a wife, her charms, how good she is at talking, that's the favor, is the people. And beauty is vain, and her looks, that's not what counts. A woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. That is so important. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. So this is what, this is the advice. 
that Bathsheba gave Solomon. She said, don't have girlfriends, don't drink alcohol, do what's right, and marry a virtuous woman. That's good advice for everybody here. So why do we honor mothers? Well, there's three re reasons in this passage, and I'll give them to you quickly. She says, what my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. So what my son, the reason I give there is procreation. He's her son. She procreated him. She gave birth to him. That's the first reason. Here's the second. What the son of my womb. The son of my womb. He wasn't her adopted son. He wasn't, she didn't have him by a surrogate mother, right? Like Rachel and Leah did. <laughs> no, no. The son of my womb, right? You know, that that's the second reason is pain. First is procreation. Second is pain. Here's the third. What the son of my vows purpose the third is purpose you see we don't know what those vows were but we know that Bathsheba made some vows to God when she gave birth to Solomon and we'll talk first about procreation what my son hey listen now this is for all the kids you ready listen well those of you that still have living mothers you need to hear this too hey listen because not everybody you know, you might have a complicated relationship with your if you have a if you're here and you have a, a mother that's still alive, because not all relationships in families are perfect. Okay, but listen to this. She said, "What my son, right? Procreation, like she gave birth to him. Listen, if it wasn't for your mother, you wouldn't be here. Amen. You get that, Amen. young people, everyone. If it wasn't for your mother, you wouldn't be here. Hey, listen." You may not have seen your mother in years. You may have complicated feelings about your mother. But you know what? If it wasn't for her, you wouldn't be here. Every time you make a choice to live and you want to live, you're saying your mother made a good choice by bringing you into the world. So be thankful for your mother. Even if that was the only thing she did was give you life. That's everything. Amen. That's everything. I mean, if you don't have life, you don't exist. That's everything else's details, right? I mean, life is all about that you're alive. Everything else is just details. So, the first reason is procreation. She says, what, my son? If it wasn't for your mother, you wouldn't be here. Everything you enjoy in life is because of your mother. How's that? Well, if you weren't alive, you wouldn't enjoy it. Anything that happens in your life, any positive experience you've ever had in your life, anything good that's ever happened in your life, you would not have experienced that if your mother had not given birth to you, if she had not given you life. Even if that's all she did was give you life. That's something. That's a lot. And the Bible says you've got to honor your mother. If it wasn't for your mother, you wouldn't be here. Everything you enjoy in life is because of your mother. And listen to this. Everything you accomplish in life is because of your mother. Think about it. If your mother gave birth to you and abandoned you and gave you up for adoption, even if she did that, which I don't think you, she should have done, but even if she did that, anything you accomplish in life are because she gave you life. If you become president of the United States and you've never seen your mother because she gave you up for adoption when you were a little baby, you know what? You would never have become president of the United States if she had not given you life. Amen. Think about it. So, procreation. Everything you accomplish in life is because of your mother. You didn't do anything to be born. Did you know that? It was a gift. Is there like a special room somewhere where your mom went in and said, do you want to be born? Okay, all right. And okay, sure. You know, No, you didn't make a choice to be born. It was a gift. Nobody asked you permission to be born. You were just born. It was a gift. You didn't do anything. You're like, I'm so awesome. Did you know I was born? <laughs> we can see that. Now do something with your life. No. But <laughs> you didn't do anything to be born. It's a gift. Hey, thank your mother for the gift of life. Thank your mother for the gift of life. She's still around. If she's not around anymore, thank God for giving you a mother that gave you life. What, my son? He was her son, and really that's enough. But that's the first thing she said. What, my son? That's procreation. Here's the second reason we honor mothers. First reason of procreation. She gave you life. That's enough reason to honor her. No matter what she did from then on out, if she gave you life, you can honor her for that. Now number two, pain. Pain. She says, what, the son of my womb? Hey, if she came from his womb. You know, I've always had this thought. 
and I'm sure all the ladies here know all about this, and I don't. I had this years ago. I, I, it it might have been like when my wife first got pregnant, but it might have even been before she first got pregnant. I had this thought. It must be a strange feeling to know that something is growing inside you, and it's getting bigger and bigger, and it has to come out. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what that's like. Ladies, if you try to tell me what that's like, but it, it, I'm a man, that, that, that seems kind of scary. Well, maybe I should be honoring of my mother and the mother of my children. Because, man, this thing is growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. You know, like bears, they give birth to, to babies and they're like tiny. You know, there's so many animals, so many animals. Most animals give birth quite easily. And there are many animals that have tiny, tiny babies. It's like nothing. It's like, oh, whoops. oh, look at that. I had a baby. <laughs> it's amazing. There's some really large animals that have very small children. <laughs> Well, I wasn't constipation after all. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, we got visitors. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. We got to the strangest Mother's Day sermon ever. Sorry. I apologize. I apologize. I'll try to get back on trust. That's why you got to pray for your pastor. Like three I apologize. What is this? A stand of comedy or a, pre or a sermon? Okay. But listen. So back to the topic. Your mother went through a lot of pain when you were born. She went through a lot of pain. Your mother went through a lot of pain to raise you. It wasn't just the, child, the birth itself. It was, she went through a lot of pain to raise you. Your mother made a lot of sacrifices. She went without sleep. She had to be with you when you were throwing up when you were sick. She had to change your diapers. I changed a few. They're not very pleasant, especially when they get older. <laughs> My son's just, just beginning to experience this. <laughs> but man... What the son of my womb? There's a lot of pain in childbirth. There's a lot of pain in raising children. It's hard. Listen, if all your mother did was give birth to you and then give you up for adoption, <coughs> hey, you can thank her for the gift of life and that she's willing to go through that pain, just that initial pain of childbirth. But boy, if your mother put up with all that she did while you're growing up, man, you need to honor her. You need to thank her. Do not take that for granted. Your mother made a lot of sacrifices. Sleep, sickness, diapers. Your mother had no free time. Hey, if you got too much time on your hands, have some kids. I got some advice for you. Just have some kids. Amen. You will have no more time. You'll fill up all your time. You've like, got hours and hours today. What am I going to do? Have some kids. Have some kids. It's the best cure for boredom there ever was. All the things parents go through, boredom is not one of them. <laughs> Am I right that your boredom is cured? You know, a lot of teenagers like, I'm bored, I'm bored, my life is bored. <laughs> get married, have some kids. Your wife won't be bored. The reason you need to get married and then have kids is if you have kids and don't get married, your life will be way, way, way worse than just bored. Mm -hmm. Which is just not boring, okay? It'll be, you'll be way too busy. So get married and have kids. At least you have someone to share it with, okay? Your mother had no free time, but she did it because she loved you. She made sacrifices because she loved you. Thank your mother for the sacrifices that she made. The number one pain. What, my son? No, I'm sorry, number one procreation. What, my son? Um, she brought, gave you life. Thank her for that. Be grateful for that. Honor her for that. But number two, pain. She went through a lot of pain, not just in childbirth, but raising you. Thank your mother the gift of life and also thank your mother for the sacrifices she made and number three purpose what the son of my vows that's an interesting statement isn't it the son of my vows you know what a vow is it's basically a promise when you make a promise to god that's a vow you know i don't know what bathsheba promised god but i bet it has something to do with proverbs 31 what she's teaching him here you know, here, here, here's, here's what I think probably happened. I'm sure something close to this is the truth. She sinned with David. She had a child. That child died. She got pregnant. Again, the Bible says that he went and comforted his wife, and she conceived. And it says, and the Lord loved him. And he sent by the hand of the prophet Nathan, and they named him Jedidiah, beloved of the Lord. So God is comforting Bathsheba and David after they sinned because David did genuinely repent. 
And so God is comforting them. There's going to be consequences. And oh, those of you who've been reading in 1 Samuel, oh, the second Samuel, the consequences are just heartbreaking. You know, I was just thinking, you know how you see new things every time you read the Bible? Well, you know how we've been in 2 Samuel, right? And I was thinking, God took how many chapters? So much detail. Amnon had a friend. Tamar. Amnon. Absalom killing Amnon. Absalom leaving. Absalom coming back. Absalom becoming the king. Absalom taking up an army to go kill his own father. His father fleeing. What happened with Absalom and the concubines on the roof? And on and on and on. It's so much detail. And you know what we say? Just like, Pastor, you got into a little bit of detail there. We look at the Bible and we're like, why all this detail? Have you ever been frustrated as a passage where it's like it skipped over 30 years? And you're like, what happened to those 30 years? God's like, you don't even know. But then all of a sudden it's like, it's going so slow and it's telling us every detail of the consequence of David's sin. And then Hushai said this, and Ahithophel said this. And Ahithophel went out and hanged himself. I'm like, why do we need to know all this, God? Why are you going so much detail? Hey, it's all a result of that sin. And today I was like, the Bible just, it's like David's life slows down to a crawl in that passage, in, in those few chapters, isn't it? It's like it slows down to a crawl. And God makes sure to let you know every detail of the consequences of David's sin. And yet David is one of the heroes of the Bible. David wrote the Psalms. Isn't that odd? Like David's like this hero and this villain all in one. Hey, listen to me. No matter how much of a hero you are, you will always be, always be also a villain. The hero side of you is when you're walking in the spirit. The villain is when you're walking in the flesh. We're all heroes and villains in our story. And David is like that. He's the hero. He kills Goliath. He's this great king. Writes all these psalms, forgives Saul, all the amazingly wonderful things David, and then the terrible things and the consequences. And that's there for a reason. It's written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Number one, go, woof, I don't want to do what David did. Number two, have hope. Hey, God can still use him after he's saved. We need both of that. And so in this passage, God is comforting David and Bathsheba, and he says, his name is Jedidiah. They also name him Solomon, I mean peaceful, because there's going to be peace during his time. But listen, in the middle of that time of comfort, she conceives, she gives birth to Solomon, and it's a time of comfort. It's a time of encouragement after the sin. And Bathsheba makes some vows to God. And you know what? I would be willing to bet that most mothers do this. You have that baby, maybe you're pregnant, or maybe the baby is newly born, and you start thinking about that child, that life that you brought in the world. You think about their future, and you think about yourself and the mistakes that you've made. You think about things that you've done that you regret, and you look at that child, and you have this, maybe it's not a stated with words, maybe it's not a clearly articulated prayer, maybe it's just a desire in your heart, but it's God, I want to be a good mother. I haven't always been a good mother, but I want to be a good mother. I haven't always been made good decisions, but I want to make good decisions now. And God, I want my child to grow up to be a godly person. I want my child to be different than me. This is a new life, and they haven't made any mistakes yet. And God, I am going to dedicate this child to you, Lemuel, belonging to God. And I want this child to do something for you. And a mother's attitude toward her children is born out of that deep desire for there to be a change, for there to be something new, for there to be something better for her children. Well, what does that have to do with honoring them? Hey, listen, young people and everybody here, you have no idea what anguish of heart mothers go through because of their vows. Because they vowed, I'm going to be a good mother. I'm going to raise my children to serve you and follow you. And then they're praying for that child, that that child will grow up to serve God and, and not make the same mistakes as them. And yes, we're all human. And yes, that child is not going to be perfect. And yes, that child has a sin nature. But mothers go through so much turmoil and heartache because they want that child to serve God. They want that child to make better choices. Even if they're not Christian mothers, they want that child to be successful in life and make good choices. Mothers go through that 
What? The son of my vows. Bathsheba made some vows to God. She said, God, I haven't done right in the past, but I want to start doing right now. And God, I lost that other child, and I'm praying that you will use this child in a powerful way. And so she tells Solomon, she's like, Solomon, blend you up. You belong to God. And I want you to make good choices. You are the son of my vows. I gave you to the Lord. And I want you to serve and follow God. Listen, young people, you need to honor your mother because she has been through so much. Number one, she gave you life. Number two, she went through a lot of pain and suffering. But number three, she has vows that she has made to God for you. And there is nothing that would be more hurtful to your mother than for you to go, because you have free will. You don't have to follow the Lord and make good choices. You don't have to follow your mother's counsel. It would nothing be more painful and hurtful to her than for you to go astray <coughs> from the vows that she has made about you. And that's why she told Solomon, what the son of my vows. Purpose. Number one, Procreation. Number two, pain. Number three, purpose. What the son of my vows. Hey, God has a purpose for your life. Your mother has a purpose for your life. Not to micromanage you, tell you who to marry and where to go to school and all the things to do. Not all that. Not when you're an adult. She doesn't want to control every detail of your life, but she wants you to make good choices. She wants her to make, you, make her proud. She wants you to serve God. And she may be imperfect like Bathsheba, but she probably hasn't even done anything as bad as Bathsheba. <laughs> She might have, but either way, it doesn't matter. Bathsheba said, the son of my vows. And think about your mother and the purpose. Bathsheba had, give, had given Solomon to God. Bathsheba had a purpose for Solomon's life. Every mother has a purpose for a child's life. Mothers want their children to be honest, obedient, and hardworking. They want their children to make them proud. They want to feel that the sacrifices were worthwhile. Tell your mother it was worth it. All the sacrifices she went through. Tell her it was worth it, but show her that it was worth it by your life. The best way you can honor your mother is to obey and follow God. Amen. That's the way you can honor your mother. Because you know what? If you're living a life of sin and disobedience to God, that Mother's Day card is not going to mean anything to her. That Mother's Day card you give her every year, if you're living in sin, we almost like you're mocking her. Because you're saying with your mouth, with your card on paper, oh, thank you for being my mother. Thank you for giving me life. While with your actions, you are going in every way the opposite of the vows that she made to God for you. So if you really want to honor your mother, follow and obey God. That's how you can honor your mother. Who is Toya Graham? We're done. Just going to tell you who Toya Graham was. Toya Graham was a mom, a 16-year-old young man in Baltimore in 2015. And she made the national news because, if you remember when there was a, 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 a person who was arrested named Freddie Gray, and he was put in the back of a police van, and he was handcuffed, and somehow, either he threw himself against the back of the van or whatever, or they were driving recklessly, we don't know what happened, but whatever happened, he ended up breaking his neck and dying in the back of the police van. So, of course, there was rioting in the streets of Baltimore in 2015 over this Freddie Gray incident. And so there's a lot of young black men that were out fighting with police and throwing things at the police. And she told her son, so Abraham said, you are going to go to school and you're going to come right back from school and you stay away from that, those riots and you respect the police. That's what she told him. And so she got a bad feeling and he wasn't home yet. So she went out the streets looking for her son. And she saw her son throwing bricks at the police. And she just runs out in front of everybody, and everybody's there filming, and so there's the viral videos, you can go look them up on YouTube. She goes run out, screaming at him, and he's wearing a, a mask covering his face, and he said she just turned, she said he just turned and looked at her, and they made eye contact, and she knew it was him, even though he was disguising himself, front recognized his clothes, dude. And she just went out in the middle of the chaos, the police and everything, throwing the rocks and the tear gas. She ran out there, and she just grabbed, she's shorter than him, you know, he's 16 years old. She just grabbed him 
And by the hood, and yanked him over, yelling and screaming, not excusing us, swearing at him, you know, and pulling him out. And she said, I told you to go home, and you don't blank. And he's like, do that. And she's just smacking him on the head as hard as he can. And he's like cowering and running. <laughs> but she was the hero of that story because she went out and found her son and brought her back. And here's how I picture her. What, my son? And what, the son of my womb? And what the son of my vows? That's what she was saying. And so afterwards, she was like interviewed on talk shows and everything. She became famous. Toya Graham, you can look her up. And she goes, that's my son. And he's out there messing with those police. And you know, that son to this day says, that totally changed the course of my life. When my mom went there and did that. I mean, and then there was a little arguing was she abusive, you know, all the, <laughs> she, she's smacking her son as hard as she can on live TV <laughs> and screaming at him, like chasing him home, hitting him, like running home. She's like, get back there, we go, you know. And she would never back down. They interviewed her, she's like, absolutely not, that's my son. Toya Graham cared about her son. What my son, what the son of my womb, what the son of my vows. Your mother cares about you. God commands you to honor her. Thank her for giving you life. Thank her for all the sacrifices she has made. Show her it was worth it by making good choices in life. Don't live to please yourself. Please God by honoring your mother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know this is a simple message. Honor your mother. But boy, is it needed today. Father, it's considered fashionable and cool now for young people to go on TikTok and Facebook and YouTube and just cut down their parents to say how mad they are at the way that they were raised and everybody's doing it. People who come from good homes are doing this now. Father, we need this message now more than ever that we need to honor mothers, not just because of procreation, not just because of pain, but also, Father, because of purpose. Our mothers have a purpose for our life, and that's a good purpose. And I pray, Father, that we would want to honor our mothers. But the best way we can honor our mothers is to please God. God, I pray that you help us take this to heart and value the institution of motherhood that you create. Thank you, Father, for our mothers and all that they went through for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.